So we kicked off this series a couple weeks ago called Exiles. Uh, it's, we asked this question, how are followers of Jesus to live in the ever-turbulent 21st century? How are we uh, to really navigate these culturally complex times that we're facing and we, we said this, and we're going through the book of 1 Peter, that the book of 1 Peter is God's answer to that question for us today. The major theme is this, that live as exiles. We're to live as immigrants. We're to live as sojourners and pilgrimers, people who don't call this home, who are transitory, who have another home awaiting. And so there's a different perspective by which we live and the uh, an idea of the permanence here. And Josh, I'm super loud, and I think I'm going to annoy some people by the end of the, uh, the sermon there. So let's live as exiles who possess a living hope that produces this holy or distinct living. Live as those who are temporary residents of this world, who have an eternal perspective that live out this very distinct, set-apart life. And in fact, this is chapter 1 of 1 Peter. Chapter 1 unpacks this entire major theme, and then chapter 2, 3, 4, and 5 is then he's going to shift to practically how do we live as exiles who possess this living hope, who then live out this holy life. What does it look like? And in chapter 2, the Apostle Peter is going to talk to us about this new kind of community this kingdom community that we're to be a part of that is radically different than the way the world or our culture arranges community. Peter's going to uh, say that exiles, you are now part of a new family. Remember this last week, new birth. And so you're in a new community. It's a kingdom community whose king is Jesus. And so our loyalties are are then aligned to his ways and his calling. And so we want to talk about this morning, what does it look like to live out this new kind of community? How do we actually practically function where we're the hands and feet of Jesus? If you got your Bibles, would you open them up to 1 Peter chapter 2? We're going to dive in. And this morning, what we want to do is uh, look at four pictures, four distinctions of this new kind of community, of what it looks like to to be a community that's filled with hope, that isn't based on temporal hope, to be a community that lives a holy life, that is distinct, that is winsome, that is loving, that loves the least of these, that that sees the unseen. He's going to give us these four distinctives of this new kind of community. And so he gives us, uh, what I'm going to show you is just four pictures. And I just hope these pictures stay with you. They are imprinted on your heart and mind of the type of community he wants to see in this church here at Awakening. The type of people he wants us to be. All right, you ready? Come on. We'll try it one more time. You ready? Yes. All right, here we go. Picture number one. Picture number one. You ready to fill it in? Dirty clothes. You're like, okay, thank you. Okay, wow. <laughs> you got me all excited for that. Dirty clothes. Yeah, the picture that the Peter wants to have first come to our mind when we're talking about, when we're thinking about community, is dirty clothes. Notice what he says, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, and anytime we see a therefore, we ask the question, what is it? Anybody? Therefore, yeah. Therefore, in light of chapter 1, in light of this call to live as an exile, who are, have this living hope, living out a holy life, therefore then rid or take off, circle that word rid, take off, and the picture is dirty clothes, take off these dirty clothes. Well, what is the dirty clothes? Rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like, wow, man, Ingram, we are starting fast. We're jumping right into the deep end this morning. There's no story to just kind of ease me in this morning. Just rid yourself of malice. Amen by myself. (laughs) None of you are like, oh, I I walked in with malice today. Did you feel that, that malice in your heart? 
See, we don't use these words, but this is actually, these words, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander, this is the way our world operates in regards to getting ahead and making it through. Because our, our world's really about self-protection, isn't it? Our world's about self-centeredness. Our world is about how do I get mine and make sure I keep mine. And so these words become indicative of the way we function and operate in community. And here's what Peter's saying. These attitudes and behaviors are community killers, though. And they are killers to the new kind of community's crane. Well, what is malice? Malice is a desire to harm. It's being mean-spirited. It's a disposition or attitude of angst or ill will towards another. This is an attitude of the heart towards another person. This isn't an action. See, we, we often think about it like, well, I didn't do anything to them. Yeah, but did you think about it? Do you have this heart towards them where you'd say, I wish, you wouldn't say this out loud, but inside you feel this, I wish their failure. I wish they would get what they deserved. You ever felt that? Is there this little party that happens inwardly when they trip or when they stumble? When when you see the person that that there's ill will in your heart, where there's this 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 mean spiritedness, you just go, and and we justify it, don't we? Well, they deserved it. They're jerks. And yet what Peter says is, no, 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 get rid of your malice. It's about your heart and what's going on inside of you. Take off the dirty clothes of deceit. Deceit is taking the advantage through underhanded methods or setting a trap. Deceit is, in our world, it can be, it's kind of the currency of the business world at times, isn't it? Withholding information. This power play, setting someone else up for a failure, lying or not quite telling the whole truth to get ahead. He says, take this attitude and these actions off. Take off the dirty clothes of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy means to create a public impression that is at odds with one real, one's real purpose or motives. It literally comes from wearing a mask. Let me ask you, is the person who shows up Sunday the same person who shows up Monday? Is there a person that shows up at a certain meeting or at, the, at your university that shows up to... Your group on Wednesday night that shows up, he says, take off the mask. Take off the hypocrisy. Take off saying, this is what I believe, but this is actually how I live. Then he says, envy. Envy is spite and resentment toward the success or possessions of another. Where you just look around and you go, I just want what they have. I, I, I can't celebrate other people's success. In fact, envious, when we're envious, what we do is we criticize the success of other people's motives. Like when, when other people are successful, we criticize their motives. Well, they're just doing that in this way, and they got there the wrong way, and they did all these sort of things. Slander. The act of speaking ill of others, cutting someone down. It's gossip. It's these passive, aggressive comments that just seep out. It's the prayer request. That is about another person, but it's just to put them in a bad light. Oh, Lord, would you please help this person? I'm going to share it in my group. This, this coworker, but... The only picture that comes to anyone else's mind is how awful of a person they are. It says there's a new kind of community, and here's what we have to understand. This new kind of community begins first by taking off the dirty clothes. I grabbed this. This is one of my own white t-shirts. 
I went into the backyard and rubbed dirt all over it. And then I saw my nine-year-old son come in from a soccer game, sweaty and stanky and dirty. I'm like, I didn't have to dirty this in the first place. I could have just brought his stinky, dirty jersey. All of you thought a lot about what you are going to wear today to church, and none of you showed up like this. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. But some of you did. Some of us did. See, this is a community killer, our attitude of the heart. Th these actions, he's saying, you know what? You have to take off the dirty clothes. The dirty clothes that kill the community around you has, has this attitudes of the heart to harm and deceit and hypocrisy and envy. These things kill. These things kill community. In fact, this word rid, it's in the aorist, means it's this snapshot event. It's a point in time that happens, but it's in the middle tense. It's in this idea that it's a voice that signifies the subject is being affected by its own actions. See, some of you don't realize you need to do some things in your Christian life. You need to take off some things. You need to acknowledge there, these are a reality of where I'm at, and I'm going to take it off. Stop tolerating it. Ta stop explaining it or excusing it away. You see, we say it this way, well, that's just the way I am. Culturally, what we say is, you know, don't change me. Like, no. The Christian life is fundamentally about life change, being formed into the likeness of Jesus. That's just my personality. I'm Italian. I'm Irish. It's just my upbringing. Peter says, a new kind of community takes off the dirty clothes. Is there areas, are some of these areas... Things that you need to acknowledge, this is in my life, and it's having the same effect as if I showed up to a party wearing this shirt. And it's killing the community around me, and it's killing the community of Christ. First picture, dirty clothes, and the question then is, well, how exactly do I take off those dirty clothes? He's going to give us another picture. It's the picture of newborn babies. He moves from dirty clothes to newborn babies. Wow, that is a hard shift right there. And he says, rid yourself of all these things. Now, like newborn babies, crave. Circle that word crave. Intensely desire in fact, of the text, this is the only imperative. This is the command of the text of what we're called to do. Crave, develop an appetite for, cultivate a taste for, what? Pure spiritual milk, the word of God. Why? So that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Okay, picture number one, dirty clothes and our practice, our application, take off the dirty clothes. How do we do this? He's going to move to picture number two of newborn babies. First, a few observations here. One is everyone begins as a spiritual infant. So if you're in a group and you're like, man, they're talking about stuff I don't really understand Ask the question. We should have so much grace for those who are in the space of just learning and growing. And this should be a community where you're able to wrestle and learn and ask all those questions. There's no dumb question. There's no like, I should already know this. Everyone begins as spiritual infants. Yet, you are never intended to stay a spiritual infant. And tragically, far too many followers of Jesus stay spiritually infants. And here's the reason why. They do not align or crave the word of God. See, the word of God is the pure spiritual milk. Right here. It says crave the pure spiritual milk. Like have this intense desire and longing for God's word. Here's what we do is we, instead of the pure spiritual milk of God's word, we have milk substitute. 
Here's my illustration. It's not even that good. It's a baby bottle. <laughs> and this morning, I finally thought of a better illustration, but I couldn't. I was going to have like uh, soda and milk right next to each other. But I just have a baby bottle, and that'll do. I have three of them right here. But in the same way that a newborn baby craves its mother's milk and needs that for sustenance in life, the Apostle Peter's telling you this new kind of community takes off their old self, their dirty clothes, and they crave the word of God. There's this hunger. There's this thirst. It's like, I need this to survive. I need this. The, like the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. That the word of God is what I need. And if I, when I put God's word into my heart, when I allow myself to be transformed by the renewing of my mind in his word, that's where transformation happens. And some of you are going like, you know what? I long to see that transformation, that change. Crave his word. You know what we crave? Milk substitute. Who's your, what's your favorite podcast? Nothing bad about it. It's good. But it, get into God's word. What's, your, what's the newest blog that's, you know, the, always searching for the new information? How about that Christian book? Nothing against Christian books. Those are great, but it's not the main mill. Or your favorite preacher or that social media feed. Listen, listen, listen. Spiritual growth is dependent upon what you crave. So let me ask you, what do you crave? Your spiritual walk, your spiritual growth, your transformation is dependent upon what you crave. And the reality is, is we feed on the news, don't we? We feed on the social media. Uh, we feed on whatever the coolest next Netflix show is. Whatever you consume consistently is what you will begin to crave. Let me say it again. Whatever you consume consistently is what you begin to crave. And he says, take off dirty clothes. What we have to do is recognize we have to take off this actions. Well, how do we do that? Develop a craving for the word of God. Okay, develop a craving. How do I do that? You get in God's word consistently. The reason on the back of your notes there is homework is to help you get into God's word consistently and spend time with him. There's a memorization verse every single week that you would put God's word into your heart and, or into your heart and to your mind. That you begin to think and ponder and begin to ask God to speak to you. That you would grow in a group. Develop a hunger, develop a craving, develop an appetite. Just as a newborn baby longs for its mother milk where you go, man, I need your word. I, I, I just got to be with you. I want to hear from you. You know, a strange thing happens when I eat healthy. Oh, it happens to you too. I crave healthy food. When, and the inverse, however, is true. When I do not eat healthily, I do not crave healthy food. In fact, at my house last night, my son had a friend over. They're hanging out. And my wife wants to make our house an awesome place for kids to hang out. And so she's got those Dorito chips. And then we had this orange chicken. Yeah. I know they don't go together, but somehow they go together. Listen, if you're filling your life filled with spiritual junk food, you will crave spiritual junk food or the ways of this world. If you fill your life and your heart with God's word, your craving changes. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And yes, I'm starting Whole30 on Monday. <laughs> I want to change it physically as well. 
and you're like, okay, but I've tried, I've gotten in, I don't know how to do this. Now, there's a reason CrossFit people are so crazy. <laughs> it's a tribe moving together that has intense accountability. Hey, I'm a part of CrossFit. I wear the t-shirt. Clean eating. Hello. Here we go. Because there's something about doing it together that helps us grow and, and continue and develop that craving. In fact, everything in this text is not you singular, but you plural. And the point is the community, not just the individual. And so for some, you have got caught into the trapping of, I'm just going to try to solo this thing on my own. I'm going to try to rid this on my own. I'm going to try to crave this on my own. And the same way, when I do a diet or some of those Whole30, I have to do it with somebody. And the what, reason why CrossFit worked for you is you're with a group of people moving in the same direction. You have to get with other believers moving in the same direction that have the same cravings. This is why the third picture, Peter says then, he moves from newborn babies to a spiritual house. Notice what he says. As you come to him, the living stone, speaking of Jesus, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, then you also, like living stones, and that you, it's plural, so you can just write, I'm from Texas, I'm kind of, I was born there, but I grew up in Santa Cruz, y'all, 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 like living stones, I went into the draw, and being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices accept, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Picture number one, dirty clothes. Application. There is an action for you to recognize I need to take off these dirty clothes, these attitudes of the heart that seep into community and kill it. How? How? Newborn babies begin to crave the word of God. Okay, then he says, God's actually doing something bigger together, this spiritual house. We're going to move and run together. And he says this. Notice, first observation under here, Jesus is the foundation of this community. In fact, as you study the text, he's going to go on and, and talk about Jesus being the cornerstone. He is the foundation of why we gather we don't gather for community's sake. We don't gather for cool co uh, content. We don't gather just simply to have coffee on a Sunday or even to get our needs met or our own preferences. We gather because Jesus is the foundation of our gathering, the reason, the author and the perfecter of our faith, this way the author of Hebrews would say it. Jesus is the foundation and the gathering point. And the question is, are you building your life upon the foundation of Jesus? And he says this, and I want you to have this picture in your mind as a spiritual house. As we together collectively run towards him, he says this, it's so powerful. We are living stones, not living bricks. Living stones. Not a living brick. See, I think sometimes in church world, when we think about it, is we think we should all look alike, dress alike, talk alike. That we have to be molded into this uniformed brick. And he says, no, you're a living stone. You're uniquely made. Design. This is why it's so important to understand what we need to get rid of, what is, what is dirt and rot on the outside, so that we can see, okay, we are a stone that's uniquely designed by our creator, and you have a master architect that's placing you a part of his spiritual building. See, see the, the aim is unity in Christ, not uniformity, that we all look the same thing. He's going, you are a living stone. Stone uniquely designed, and so each stone is essential to the building up of the house here. 
Like we're part of one another. And your unique shape and design and personality and, and giftings are made to fit just so with another uniquely made stone. And so as a spiritual house, the application is for us to engage in the spiritual house of God. Engage. See, what we can't do is we can't be a spectator church and be a part of the new kind of community. We can't just come, sit, watch, grab our coffee, and go. See, another way to say it is you do not go to church. We are the church. One of the beautiful parts about not having a building, and I'm praying we have a building soon, but you cannot confuse awakening with a building. The church is the people of God gathered together on mission and the purpose of God. It's in us. You don't go to church. You are the church, and so wherever you go into your workplace, church is happening. Wherever you go to your neighborhood, church is happening. When you gather in your small group, church is happening. See, we have to engage in the spiritual house of God. We have to allow the master architect to build us together, to, to cooperate with the spirits working, where we're no longer a consumer but a contributor, not a critique of the church but a co-laborer in what Christ is doing here. What does it look like to engage? It means to worship regularly, to gather, to, to have this moment where God begins to stir in our heart, that we would serve with our gifts, the community in awakening and outside of awakening, where we would make sure that we're growing together, running together in Christ, where we'd give both of our time, our talents, and our treasure to, to engage and to build up his, his church. That's what it means to engage. Well, how do you engage Fourth and final picture, we engage as a royal priest. See, you're not just a living stone. There's something even more amazing than that. That's why it's so important. He starts off, rid yourselves of this. It has no place in our community. Crave God's word. He's got so much for you. Do you not know who you are? Being built up into the spiritual house, he says this. But you are a chosen people. You're wanted. You're handpicked. God doesn't just like you. He wants you and chose you. You move from being rejected, and maybe this week was a rejecting week, to accepted in Christ. A royal priesthood. We said in week one that Peter uses distinctly Jewish language designated solely for the Jewish people to apply to this Gentiles living uh, in the province of Asia Minor. And here he does it uh, throughout this entire text and bringing to mind the image of what Israel was intended to be but never lived out. In Exodus 19.6 it says, speaking of Israel, and you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You are to, to do community in life in such a different way that, that it brings others to me. See, a royal priest, you are not, you don't get to choose royalty. No one wakes up and goes, I would like to be royal today. In fact, I'm going to pursue the crown. I'm going to be royal. You're born into royalty. You're born into a new family. You are a son and daughter of the king. And a priest's role was to bridge the gap between man and God, to bring man closer and woman closer to God. It says you're a holy nation. You're God's special possession. Why? 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 That you may declare excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Like you are not just a new kind of community 
just to be a new kind of community. You are a new kind of community on purpose, on mission, to declare the excellencies, to declare the praises, to declare the glory of the one who called you, who chose you, who loved you, who redeemed you, who made you a brand new person, a son or daughter of the King Most High. You're to declare those praises to a hurting, hopeless world. You have a purpose on this planet and it's connected to the community that you're in to be the voice of hope to a hurting world. And so I want you to just think about this. Every follower of Jesus is a minister. Every follower of Jesus is a minister of the gospel. I don't know what you thought when you walked in this morning, but the picture Peter wants you to have is, is you are a minister of the gospel. You're like, no, Ryan, that's what you are. No, no, no. No, no, It's what you are. No, you are. You are. You are. You are. We're just going back and forth now. Peter says you are a minister. And you are born into it spiritually through the work of the Spirit of God. And you have a unique role based on how he made you to live as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the places that he's put you. Um, where, where is it? Hang on. Here we go. Would you grab this card for me? I've been a pastor for full-time for 15 years. And for those 15 years, I have never had my own business card. This is not a request. It's actually intentional. In a world, in a business world, where we hand out business cards like, you know, they're trading cards... It's quite embarrassing at times. Everybody's got their business card, handing them out. I'm like, I don't have a business card. We made business cards. These are the only business cards we have as Awakening. Here's what I want you to do. Right in the middle of that, write minister. Go for it. Some of you are like, really? Yeah, go for it. See, would you embrace your new job title? You have a business card now. You're a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a reason I don't like to go by pastor, because it elevates and it creates this false dichotomy. And I know for some, your, your background, it, and it, it's significant to say Pastor Ryan But the truth of the matter is, is you are a pastor and you have been placed in wherever God has you to be a pastor to Google, to be a pastor to that coffee shop, to be a pastor to that workout area. Workout area? What do we call those gyms? Gosh. Come on, Ingram. Would you embrace a new job title, not... Your job title is no longer developer, it's no longer engineer, it's no longer just accounting or barista or waitress or waiter or manager or construction worker or doctor or nurse or plumber or whatever your job title is, teacher, your job title is minister of the gospel through teaching. Minister of the gospel, and I just happen to be an engineer. Minister of the gospel. See, and what gives flesh to that ministry is when we take off the dirty clothes, when people see a new kind of community that's lived out. When they see a people that hunger and thirst after God's word. When they see where the differences don't divide us. They see a church that's unified based on the foundation of Jesus Christ and what we have in common in Jesus is way greater than any other thing we have not in common. Just imagine. Imagine this room if we really believed we could be this kind of community. What would happen? 
What would happen in your workplace, in your neighborhood, at your school, if you embraced a new job title for your life? I want you to stand up with me as we close. And I don't have some awesome, heartfelt, compelling story to close, and it's intentional. I want us to apply this message. I I want us to to not just go, okay, that was cute, Ryan. Nice baby bottle. I want you to ask specifically as we worship together, what do I need to do with what I just heard? What do I need to do with what I just heard? Is there some dirty clothes and attitudes that I need to take off? Do I crave God's word? Do I need to get into a group? Do I just need to carry this thing around with me and remind myself of my holy calling? What is my next step? Which picture do I need to put into practice? Jesus, I ask in this moment, Holy Spirit, you would speak so clearly to our hearts and that we would be responsive to your word. We would not just be hearers of your word, we would be doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.